Okay, the meeting is called back to order at 6.33 p.m. Please rise and the clerk will lead us in the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, may I have, please have a motion and a second that the board approves the April 16th, 2024 agenda as submitted. So moved. Second. second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Can I have a motion and a second that the board approves the, the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. <clears throat> May I please have a motion and a second that the treasurer's report, including the cash report, general fund cash report, the general fund revenue, revenue status report, general fund budget status report, school lunch fund cash report, and school lunch fund revenue and expense budget report for the month ending January 30th, or 31st, excuse me, 2024 be approved. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Okay, special reports. We do have a couple of special reports this evening. Um, first, we have an equity and access update really focused on special education. So I will invite up uh, Mr. Black and Mr. Dressler and Ms. Fitch and Ms. Lerner and Ms. Sapone. And as they're coming uh, to take their seats to present, I would just like to point out to the board um, and people in the audience that uh, the library looks much different this time than it did the last meeting because as our wonderful student rep might tell us later, this is now a cafeteria <laughs> as we are starting construction on the other cafeteria. And then once that's complete, this will become uh, a library again. So I'll turn it over to the team. I believe you've got the clicker and it should be good to go. Good evening, good Board evening. of Education. My name is Scott Dreschler and just want to <clears throat> quickly thank you. It's an honor and a privilege for our ability to be able to present to you on celebrating all things special education and the things that we've been able to do over the last year. I'm gonna have everybody introduce themselves. Hi, good evening, my name is Mary Sapone. Uh, hi, I'm Jen Lerner. Hi, Laura Fitch. And hi, Michael Black. So thank you again. We are very honored to be able to be here tonight. So what we'd like to do is just a brief overview of what the role of a special education administrator looks like in Penfield. Talk briefly about our continuum of special education services. Dive into the professional development that we've been able to build and provide throughout the year. And then just talk a little bit about special education next steps. I promise it's not going to be all me talking. I do, I am able to be able to come here. It's very nice sometimes under the Office of Instruction, but I can't tell you again, this is the first time in my nine and a half years here where we have had the whole special education team present to the Board of Ed. So we are very excited for this. So the role of a special education administrator really is such where you work with every member of the school building you collaborate with the building leadership, you collaborate with teachers, teaching assistants, all related service providers. We work in the world through, starts in general education supports through our multi-tiered system of supports, and then that goes through providing students accommodations and such through a building level based plan. We work in collaboration with that. But then we also th work through that Committee on Special Education process, and that involves referrals, compliance, New York State regulation compliance. And with that said, 
students that end up with an individualized education program or plan, they receive specially designed instruction, which is that second bullet there. That is really targeted individual instruction that New York State helps us cater to the individual needs of students. You can do that through supplementary aids and accommodations. You can do, th do that through universal design for learning with the end in sight, modifying the format in which students are presented material. There's a multitude of ways that we can meet individual needs. So we bring the knowledge to be able to support the teachers as well as their special education expertise to meet the individual needs of students. What we'll get into also is the professional development that is used to support that specially designed instruction for all staff. And then with special education comes much compliance. It comes process, procedures. Our role is to ensure that everybody that is involved, which is everybody that's involved <coughs> through supporting students, is in line and knows what we need to do to be able to provide information to the teams and families and community members to meet students' individual needs through an IEP and also through a 504 plan. In addition to that, beyond the specially designed instruction, the related services that are included in that, we work in collaboration with, and our members will get into a little bit more detail around how we support individual areas, counselors, psychologists, so Michael Black works with our school counselors, Jennifer Lerner works with our school psychologists, Laura Fitch will be working with our school social workers, and Mary Sapone helps support speech and language pathologists, because each one of those domains has their own specialty area, and in the world of special education, everybody comes together to work collaboratively to meet their needs. What we are very excited to talk more in depth about is our special education continuum of service. We have an expanded programming, kindergarten through 12th grade. We've been able to utilize general ed education settings to meet the needs of our varied learners, of students with variable learning abilities. We have been able to, K through 12, shift the location of those services into the general education classroom while at the same time maintaining an opportunity for special classes kindergarten through 12th grade. But you'll hear tonight terms as integrated co-teaching, direct consultant teacher, and related services in all of those areas. Specifically targeted related services that we've added this year are in the area of specialized reading. We've been great at meeting the needs of students through reading intervention. This year, we were able to really formalize that service on IEPs for students that qualify through that Committee on Special Education. I'm going to start turning it over now to some of the highlights at all of our grade levels as you work through the special education world. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Sapone, and I oversee preschool to first grade of special education in Penfield. Um, I have the pleasure of being able, or I guess I see my role as more parent education. Um, many people think of preschool as aged four and up, but actually I, I start providing services and supports for families as early as two years, eight months sometimes, if they're coming in from early intervention. Um, and I have the ability to help transition them from early intervention services when they're still essentially babies to the preschool special education system, which starts at three years old. Um, so I've always loved the parent education that goes into that because it is a very daunting um, process for, for parents to begin, A, for their young child, and B, to um, come into a system that has so many rules and regulations and eligibility criteria in different terms that they may not be familiar with. And so I, I do really try to um, give the basics of information to families um, and educate them on the special education process as early as possible. And I think that that really empowers them as families in being able to help and support and advocate for their child as they get older if they still need supports. Um, the other area that I am fortunate to work with, too, is their transition into kindergarten. Um, 
again, this is a huge transi transition for families. They have four-year-olds going on to, to being five, possibly needing special education services, possibly not. So sharing the differences between eligibility criteria, between preschool special education and school-age special education. Um, I've developed a process that's a year-long process to help educate families on, the, on preschool to kindergarten starting the year before they enter kindergarten, um, involving individual um, sessions with families, educating them on the different continuum, just like Scott said, of what we have here in Penfield, and also observing their children in their specific preschool special education settings. So I have um, a good idea of what they might need coming into our schools. So I really have, I, I really do find that my role is primarily parent education um, with, with families at this younger age. Um, and I've really been fortunate to expand my role to kindergarten and first grade and be able to follow the students a little bit longer in my role than I have been able to, where I just kind of lead them up to kindergarten. So it's been nice to see, um, to be in meetings and to see where they are in first grade, um, because that was not an experience I ever had before. So I, I'm very lucky to have that new role. Thank you. And to piggyback off of what Mary said, much of my role is parent education and child education. Um, I'm in a new role, so I'm starting to work in elementary two through five and working with out of district. But previously to two weeks ago, I was at Bay Trail. So I'm gonna talk a lot about what work we did at Bay Trail. Um, and one of the most important things that our team works on as a whole, but also in that school was to expand the, <laughs> to expand the continuum and make sure that we were supporting students in the least restrictive environment. So we worked to build consultant teacher programming in all of our core classes and to add ICOT sections so we would, could make sure that students with disabilities could be in the general education setting but get um, really quality curriculum with modifications. So that has been something very important to me. Um, we've also expanded the elective classes so that our multiply disabled students can participate in those general ed classes with support and worked on trainings with those teachers so they're able to best meet the students needs. Um, we have also um, expanded what we're doing in resource rooms. So within our resource rooms, we're making sure that it's pre-teaching and reteaching and very specific to the student disability and need. Um, we also have our 12-1 classes as well, but we mix the continuum. So if you need specific support that's 12-1-1 for math, you can still be in a CT ELA class. Um, other work that we've done that I think is really important is worked on things for general ed students. So prior to the CSE, making sure that we have data for MTSS. So we've added things like a drop-in center so students can see core teachers and get extra support. And then we can use that data in the MTSS process to track how often they're going and what they're working on. Um, we've added some really cool things like a quiet lunch room. So kids who are overstimulated by the noise can go to a smaller room. And we've added a Zen Den, which is a sensory sort of over input area with lights and bubble tubes that anyone can use. A Zen Den, which is sort of the removal of all of those things, just a quiet area to decompress. Um, and then, oh, that's all of them. All right, I'm also working with the psychologist. We are revamping our behavior support plans. Those are general education plans and creating a system so that we can be ensured that everyone has access that needs to know so that all kids are really appropriately supported. All right, so thank you. Um, I'm not gonna try to reiterate too much, although you'll, you'll hear some consistency across the board, which is really great. Um, two things I really wanted to highlight today for, for you are one, in addition, just building off of what Ms. Lerner just shared, is I'm extremely proud of the work that we're doing um, in regards to the expansion of the integrated co-teaching services model at the high school. So this is, I've been here just over two years. Um, and in my first year here, we were offering really at the ninth grade level that ICOT model. And each year we've, um, in collaboration with our principal, we've expanded that model up through. And so next year, I'm extremely excited to say that we will have really finished building out that model for the high school. And we'll offer, um, in ninth grade, we'll have all core courses offered. Um, and 10th grade, we'll have all core courses offered. And then in 11th grade, we are also adding a US history section. So we're super excited 
to continue to build on and as Ms. Lerner shared, get our students into that least restrictive environment to really make sure that the students that are in our 1201 or our special class um, sections, those are the students who really need that support and to try to challenge and push our students to be as independent as possible. So when that they exit and go out into the real world that they're you know, productive and prepared for the next step, whether that's work, whether that's college, or whether that's some sort of trade program. So that's our goal is to really increase independence um, as students move through our models here. Um, and the second piece that I really wanted to highlight again is the 1213 model. So we have a life-centered education program. Um, we offer a lot of the same things that Ms. Lerner just shared um, in regards to a sensory room for students, which we're super excited to build. We hired a new teacher this year um, who was a previous teacher at Mary Cariola, so we're really able to cater to our, our students who have more complex learning disabilities and complex learning needs um, to make sure that we can, um, or my, my goal is to keep as many students as possible at Penfield High School before we have to look at out of district placements and programs. So I'm super excited with the work that we're doing there. Um, and one of the things I just wanted to highlight in that program is that we have the ability to send our students to the multi-oc and focus program. So I know some of you may have awareness of what that is, um, but we're, we're able to send our, our LCE students with teacher assistance into you know, the community to whether that's a, uh, you know, a multimedia course, a, um, you know, a, a working on landscaping, um, maintenance, and we're able to send those students to get some career readiness, work readiness skills so that as they prepare for that next step, which for our 12131 program is often looking at transition services, so that's 12 plus, they have access to education through age 21. Um, and so it's really trying to get them some experiences because that transition, those transition programs really highlight those vocational skills and prepare students for that next step. So, um, you know, we're really, really excited at the high school level to continue to expand the continuum and offerings that we have. Yes, perfect. With that said, coming full circle as we come through preschool to kindergarten and first grade, when Michael and Jen and Mary talked about that full continuum, there is a full continuum as of at the end of this year. Um, that is one of my most proud things to be able to share with the Board of Education, is that we've been able to expand our ability to meet the variability of student learning profiles in a general education setting as close to the peers as possible. With that said, second through fifth grade also expanded the integrated co-teaching model in addition to the direct consultant teacher model. Um, typically things that we would service in other capacities, students are now able to be serviced within and close to their general education peers. So second grade through fifth grade has that as well. The best part I think also about this is that we started this work five years ago in the middle, sixth through eighth grade and then we built up and we built down, and now we're proud to say it's a K through 12 broad continuum. The last thing that the continuum shift impacts is our extended school year program. So through the extended school year program, the Committee on Special Education makes determinations on if an individual child shows regression over breaks or things of that sort. We al also look at students through the lens of where is the gap and where is it most significantly impacting? So if you are a fourth grader reading at a first grade level, we don't typically utilize grade levels, but looking at data through Ames Web in collaboration with the Office of Instruction and the Committee on Special Education, we were able to shift some of the location of where we service students with varying abilities from our special classes to an integrated co-teaching classroom. With that said, you cannot go from an integrated general education setting to a special class for summer instruction, but there are students that require through the Committee on Special Education and they show regression in their reading and their math abilities. We were able to offer, in addition to the special classes for students with significant cognitive and or areas of need in our 12 and one students, but students that are accessing our integrated co-teaching that have significant weaknesses in reading, a summer program that they can come and be transported to school for two days a week, or students with higher level of need four days a week for that additional math and reading support through the summer and through the CSE. So that's how it branches through the summertime and impacted our extended school year continuum as well. So before Laura Fitz transitioned to the sixth through eighth special education administrator, 
she was supporting our professional development. So I'm going to turn it over to Laura Fitch. Thank you. So yeah, as Scott shared, I was, before my um, appointment as the special education administrator at Bay Trail, I was a teacher on special assignment, and part of my role was um, supporting <coughs> the design of a comprehensive professional <coughs> development program. We began developing that program um, in the spring of last year, and in collaboration with the team, we really wanted to focus on designing a comprehensive yet targeted professional learning timeline that really focused on designing instruction and professional learning at all grade levels and across all settings. So that looked like creating opportunities for all of our consultant teachers, K-5 and 612, to spend time together, all of our 1211 teachers, K-5 and 612, to spend time together, our 12131 teachers, and our integrated co-taught teachers. We're able to have time throughout the year everybody has had at least two to three release days throughout the year spending time engaging in professional learning. The, c the topics of professional learning were driven um, by some ident identified areas of growth. Last spring we went through and reviewed some of our processes and procedures particularly around the development of quality IEPs and we really looked to see how can we improve our IEP development processes and how can we support our teachers so that they feel confident as they're developing um, those documents. And lastly, we really wanted to build a foundational system. So this year really laid the foundation for where we plan to head in future years in terms of providing release time for teachers, looking at our department meetings, our grade level team meetings, really how can we support our teachers in the existing structures and processes that we currently have. Um, <clears throat> in sharing some of those topics, um, some of the things that we looked at include aligning IEP goals to assessment scores and foundational learning skills. This is really important. We want to make sure that our students' goals are driven by the essential skills that they need to learn at each grade level and carry through with them throughout their K-12 um, schooling experience. We also looked at designing progress monitoring systems, including data tracking charts to really align our data processes in terms of connecting them to MTSS, our multi-tiered systems of support, which happened before our special education procedures, and then making sure that as we're monitoring our students' schools, we have solid data to share not only with the team, but with families and other service providers. Um, another piece of this is utilizing our current reading systems that we have. So we have a, a foundational reading program in place, which Scott spoke about through um, specialized reading as an additional related service and we really want to make sure that as our reading specialists are providing that instruction we have systems that align with our students goals and we have ways to to track their progress as a collaborative team effort another component um, is as we rolled out Scott spoke about the expansion of our integrated co-taught classes at the elementary level as we rolled that out we had the opportunity to partner with Webster and Brighton schools and be able to visit some of their integrated co-taught classes to see how they were designing their programs, how they were supporting their teachers with professional learning, and then take that learning back and digest it and see how that would look in Penfield. Um, and then lastly, we've also engaged, as Scott spoke about at the beginning, in some learning about function-based thinking in order to support our students um, in their behavioral needs, in their social emotional learning needs, and then really honing in on specially designed instruction. So how are we changing our classroom instruction? How are we changing our learning environments to really support our students and their learning profiles? And some of the other areas that we've foc focused on is universal design for learning. We partnered with Harvard, trained um, this at Bay Trail, the staff there, and district leaders in how to do universal design, which really works on modifying material for all students. So it's a tier one, tier two type of intervention. Um, and we also looked at sort of where Laura was with that ICOT CT training, creating contracts, teaching teachers how to work together collaboratively, um, creating agreements, um, looking at best practice in CT and ICOT, how to teach parallel and things like that versus one teacher, one assist. Um, we looked at templates for lesson plans that teachers could work on together so we could modify the material right in a lesson plan and work for students with divergent needs. Um, Mary Cariola came and worked with us with TAs and our 12131 teachers to work on how to support our staff and being stronger with behavior management, how to work with kids with autism and support them better, recognizing their needs and preventive strategies, and looking at working with students with communication devices and um, speech language issues. 
we've also been working on training our new APs, um, how to you know, hold a meeting and basic things like that, how to open IEPs and train clerical on procedures and uh, processes. All right, so then um, at the high school level, um, kind of building again off of what you, you may have heard, um, I mentioned to you how excited we are with the expansion of the integrated co-taught program. And so with that as the first piece that I want to talk about is, you know, in addition to the release days that Ms. Fitch shared um, for, for the different 12 one teachers, for the co-teachers, um, at the high school level we also have individual time set aside for teaching pairs to collaborate. So not only um, will, they, will they work together and kind of have a little bit of professional learning for a couple hours, but they actually will have time to co-plan plan lessons, work together to identify their, their own teaching styles, either at the end of the school year or over the summer. We really understand and we've taken feedback from teachers and understanding how important it is for them to build those collaborative partnerships and get to know one another, get to know one another's teaching styles, get to know um, how they best teach and kind of work that out prior to the start of the school year. So we offer that again um, at the end of this school year, we'll offer it for next school year over the summer. Um, so we really have different times throughout the year that we're offering that. Um, in addition to that, I'm working on identifying time. So similar to what Ms. Fitch shared again with um, doing kind of learning walks as they, they rolled out the integrated co-taught model at the elementary level, I'm working on identifying ways to have our 12131 teacher go out and see, you know, Fairport, Victor, West Sarandikoy, different 12131 programs to have an idea. Um, the of the different ways that those programs can operate just to make sure that we're best meeting our student needs. So that's an area that we're working at. Um, in addition, we've spent a lot of time within our department meeting time um, and, and just professional learning, again, on the creation of goals. Um, I know Ms. Fitch mentioned this, but another piece that we're really working on is not only aligning it to the assessment scores, but also making sure that it's aligned with students' programming and needs. So if a student is in an integrated math class, then they should have a math goal, something that's aligned with that. What are they working on? Why are they in that course? We want to make sure that our IEPs, again, align with each other. So there should be a statement of need, um, a program that's aligned to it, and a goal that goes along with that. Um, and then just for me to share out, kind of looking into next year, um, we're going to be looking at our resource room model just to make sure that we're, we have best practice um, in place, making sure that we're supporting students. You heard pre-teaching, reteaching, making sure that it's a time to really work on some of those skills, work on vocabulary. Um, so that will be a major focus area for my department next year, as well as reviewing just the transition sections of our IEPs, making sure that um, as students, again, as they work through high school, they're starting to think about what they want to do in their lives, uh, you know, are they going to go to trade school? Are they going to go to college? Are they going to go um, straight into the workforce? Um, and so, really being able to work on making sure their voice, as well as their parents' voices, are heard within the IEP, as well as captured on our, our transition or our level one assessment that we had. So, that's really the goal for next year. Those two points. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> so our next steps, again, I think is, is to thank all of you for your support. And again, Dr. Potter, um, for allowing us the, the, the honor to come here and share everything that we're doing. Because when I hear it from all the members of the team, it's a lot. And it's very much to be proud of. But the work is never done, and it's only just begun. So. As we've already started proactively planning for the rest of this year and next year collecting feedback, but that's that continued collaboration with the teachers through their feedback. They're in the classrooms every day with the teachers, our teaching assistants, our staff. Where do they see the need and how do we address that need? And it's continued collaboration and utilization of that MTSS process to support through those committee on special education referrals. And then looking at that targeted professional learning for all of staff. It's targeted professional learning for our teachers for our lunch and recess monitors, for our bus drivers. It's everyone helps all students. So with that said, please invite us back. <laughs> but we're open for any kind of questions that you may have. <coughs> Board members, <laughs> questions? <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you so much for showing up here today, and um, it's very obvious that you uh, 
um, you care about our students. And what I heard a lot of was a lot of student-centered planning. What do our students need? How can we get it to them? Who can we hire, train? And then also important too is our teachers. How can we help our teachers support our students? So I'm very excited to see where all of this goes. And I am very excited to see our two new folks in their positions. Um, and I'm just, I'm gonna keep an eye on this folks. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, there's just, there's a lot of information swirling in my head and I've made little notes of what I need to go and like look up. Like you education people and your acronyms, man. <laughs> Come on, and then you throw in ratios too. Like I know what 1211, what a 1211 setting is, but can you share with me and other members of the community what 12131 is? Yes, I can expand on that. So that's within our special class continuum, and it's 12 students maximum, one teacher, and then for every three students, there's one additional adult personnel that can be assigned to that class. Perfection. So there could be 12 students, one teacher, but there could be Three, there could be a speech pathologist that could be in the classroom, there could be a teaching assistant. But yes, for every three students, there's one adult additionally. And that pathway specifically services students with significant cognitive and or language delays mm -hmm. that may not be um, progressing towards a regents or a local diploma or exit credential in that way. They most likely may be accessing a New York State alternate assessment or a skills and achievement pathway or a skills and achievement credential. But that's the difference in that continuing okay. service. All right. Thank you for clearing that up. And last thing, um, last comment is that I am really, you know, I use excited and appreciate a lot, but those are the two words that come to mind that our special ed kids are with gen ed kids. And um, just knowing that, that if I correct me if I'm wrong, is it horizontal yeah. learning or vertical learning? When you learn from each other, yeah. you know, and that you can – you build the empathy in the gen ed kids. Like, oh, this friend of mine, you know, learns differently from me and let me understand that more. And also the special ed kids like, oh, hey, there's my friend. They get things like that, interesting. Let me see how I could, you know, be like that or let me see what kind of tricks they have. So I, cause that's the world we live in. You know, it's not just one type of person, one type of learning. It is so diverse and I appreciate that very much. Thank you. I don't have a question. I just have comments. <laughs> Surprise. Um, I just want to say I heard lots of really great things. Um, first, Tasha, thanks for all the work that you have done with your team. It's clear that you all work together with that collaboration. I heard MTSS multiple times. I heard collaboration multiple times. I love that you're bringing your support staff together and your special services together and using that common language because we all know like our kids that struggle the most, they need that common language or we just cause more confusion for them. Um, I love, um, Mary, how you talked about educating families and you talk, uh, teaching them how to be their best advocate for our kiddos because sometimes parents that aren't in the world of education, like it, they don't know and there is so much jargon and it is, can be so overwhelming, but that's their baby and that that's their world and we wanna just make sure that we continue to support them. So I pr really appreciate that. I heard of lots of transitioning. I think that's so important for those kids is just making sure that what we already know that works, that we keep doing that. And if we know it doesn't work, let's not waste our time with it. Um, lots of that least restrictive environment. I love the ICOT system. I think it's really beneficial for our, all kids and just that constant alignment and keeping those expectations high for kids. So thanks, just thanks for your hard work. I know it's hard and it's important, so thank you. Again, since going after these two, I have nothing really that I could add, but thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your support and just all of your support for our students. Thank you. Go team. Before you leave, I'll just point out, I want to thank that if I do my timeline right, I believe the two newest members of Team Penfield made sure to wear their red colors to the meeting. So just wanted you to know that I, it was noted. 
<laughs> all right and i would just second everything in, including uh, as you noticed in the presentation we're thoughtful around its equity and access special ed report because it really falls under the work we do around around equity um, out of dr potter's office and really a team approach in terms of making sure we're supporting all students um, um, who, who come through our, our doors and get them where they need to be so I, I know you guys do incredible work and i just really appreciate you coming out tonight thank you thank you thank you thank you Oh, wait, there's one more. We have a special report next. I will share, uh, it's a textbook presentation, very excited about. And we have Sheena Conway and uh, Aaron Zimmerman here with us this evening. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you for having us. I am Sheena Conway, Director of Humanities. I'm Aaron Zimmerman, uh, Department Chair for the Social Studies Department at the high school. So we are really excited to present on a new text this evening that we are recommending for a new course that we're offering at PHS next year. So the text is Freedom on My Mind. It is written by Deborah Gray White, Mia Bay, and Waldo E. Martin. We are excited because we have never offered this course before. It is a new full year AP elective uh, that will run as one full section next year. So AP African American Studies is going to be taught by Laurel Rodman and Aaron Zimmerman is a part of that collaboration. They've done a lot of work this year to prepare for the course. So it's very exciting. I also wanna mention that this course is open to any 10th, 11th or 12th grade student that is interested in enrolling in the course. There are no prerequisites that was important to us. And I have the clicker, so I should switch the slide. So the text, when we were selecting this text, we had several criteria in mind. Um, first and foremost, we needed to find a text that really centralized and put the African American experience in the foreground of American history. So this is a course that is very comprehensive. It runs for the entire year. It starts with um, the ancient African kingdoms, the African diaspora, and then it carries all the way through contemporary 21st century issues. So we needed a text that could capture all of that. We were also really interested in readability and accessibility for our students. So this is a college level course, but we want students to feel like they have access to the, the anchor text that we use for the course. I also wanna mention that College Board actually requires that we use all of their primary sources so we're lucky in that they provide us with primary sources but what they don't do is they don't provide us with a textbook and they don't provide us with secondary sources so we appreciate that choice and that freedom but it also really requires us to be thoughtful in the resources that we select. So with that, we did not feel comfortable making this decision in isolation. So we've partnered with SUNY Brockport. We actually pa partnered with their uh, Department of African American Studies. Dr. Avril Kelly has been instrumental in helping us develop this course. He also helped us choose this text, uh, in addition to helping us curate additional resources that, that we'll use for the course. And Aaron will talk a little bit more about that, but I did think it was important important to note that we did not make this this decision in isolation we felt it was important to consult with experts in the field Thank you. Thanks. there we go uh, so to give you a quick overview of how the textbook aligns to the uh, course exam description for AP African American Studies um, the course is broken into four units the first one being uh, origins of the African diaspora I um, and that it's essentially a survey of your uh, pre-diaspora uh, civilizations, all the way back to ancient Egypt, um, the, uh, the de development of the Bantu people, classical, post-classical, Sudanic empires, the Mali, the Songhai, uh, East African city-states, the Swahili city-states in trade on the Indian Ocean, uh, which veterans of AP World will be very familiar with, <laughs> uh, as well as the overall cultural and social developments during all of this time period which needs to say is a lot, um, which the textbook very much helps us with. Um, and that, and that's, so that's 11 subtopics in unit one, which chapters one and two in the textbook uh, help cover. Um, uh, unit two is broken into 24 subtopics, um, covered by chapters three through eight in the textbook. Uh, that unit is called Freedom, Enslavement, and Resistance. Um, and typically the, the order is more 2.1 through 2.9 is the, is, um, 
is the institution of slavery in the United States, uh, all the way up through 1860, the economic uh, sugar plantations. 2.10 through 2.19 are all your examples of resistance to enslavement, Stono Rebellion, the Haitian Revolution, Nat Turner, uh, the success of uh, dozens of maroon societies. And then 2.20 to 2.24, is essentially your connection from young America going into uh, the Civil War, uh, the rise of the abolition movements, um, and everything um, there as well. And then moving to Unit 3, um, the practice of freedom is pretty much right from the end of the Civil War to World War II, which is 18 subtopics uh, in itself, which is chapters 9 through 13 in the textbook. And then unit four is 21 more subtopics. It's a lot of subtopics. Um, and that's 14 through 17 in the textbook. And the textbook takes you right into the 2010s. Uh, it is one of the most contemporary textbooks I've had the privilege of working with. Um, Helen, who's a veteran of AP World, will remember that AP World is essentially like, oh, we, we got to uh, modern society. It's like the year 2000 is like what the present is. Uh, and this brings you really into contemporary America. Uh, Weaving throughout all of this is one of my favorite parts of the course. So 10% of your AP exam score is a final project. And I really do appreciate College Board for this. It is a topic of your choice, uh, it, it, anywhere within the lens of African American studies. Um, Laurel and I, when we were planning out, uh, and with as many subtopics as there are, I we pretty much planned like day to day, like this for two days, this for one day. And woven throughout that is starting as early as November, we're already starting with the project because it requires analyzing and comparing primary sources, uh, as well as a historiography of the development of African American studies itself, uh, uh, coaching students to be able to develop an argument and be able to defend that argument. But the reality is a lot of students they tend when they get when they get a lot of choice, they're going to be drawn to the more contemporary issues, which is I totally understand. Um, so the other thing the textbook really helps with is it it gives the students an ability to really start diving into the topics that they're going to be interested in that they really want to do. Um, when we're in November, which is it's going to be Unit Two, and it's probably going to be earlier in Unit Two. Um, and that's one of the nicest things with the course is. Um, it, it really, it gives the students the flexibility to really dive into what are they most uh, interested in, what do they really want to analyze. Um, and so the origins of this text, you can bounce me the next one. Uh, the origins of this textbook um, and how we ended up with it is kind of by chance when we met with Dr. Kelly. Uh, so credit to Sheena who established uh, our connection. Um, so we've met with him twice. The first time he came to PHS during one of our curriculum writing days, and we had set aside four hours, and I'm not gonna lie at the time, I was like, four hours is a lot, uh, and it flew by. Uh, he was a treasure trove of information. He brought everything he had. It gave us a, all his resources, everything for week one, all these different options for day one. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, through this partnership, we focused on uh, our three goals of engaging in learning specific to historical development of African American studies. We compiled our robust resources that have been vetted by historical accuracy, cultural relevance, and responsiveness. Uh, and we re he let us pick his brain for four hours, and he was, he was awesome. I, I really appreciated him. Um, and everything from, and he, he gave Laurel and I several different resources for us as teachers to utilize uh, a lot are, that are much more like sociological in African American studies itself and the history of it. Um, and then the second thing we did was we went and observed his uh, class. So it was a intro level uh, class for uh, African American studies and I feel the highest honor or praise you can give to a teacher is, I would have loved to have been a student in your classroom. And so, Dr. Kelly, if you're watching you know, <laughs> YouTube, I, I, I would have loved to have been a student in your classroom. That It was so engaging. Uh, the discussion questions he built for the students, every single one of them, I was like, oh, yeah, all right, I, okay. Um, and he, he really has been such an asset for us uh, to get an idea of not just how to accumulate all the resources that we need, but also 
to build a culture that's engaging, to really engage, uh, maximize student discussion, and in regards to the project, pushing them to really dig into what are they interested in. One of the questions we asked them by chance was, out of curiosity, what are the textbooks that you really, really find are successful? And he mentioned Freedom on My Mind. Um, and then we had, when we were initially starting, we emailed the general email that College Board provides. If you have any questions, email this. Um, and not a week later after he told us that, College Board also got back to us and also recommended Freedom on My Mind. It wasn't a, hey, College Board mentioned this, what do you think of this textbook? It was two separate recommendations. Uh, and they mentioned that it was recommended by the course leads who had written the course. So, I mean, that, um, you know, we had our, our two references right there that uh, was all that we needed there. Um, moving into alignment with the standards. I would just like to mention Oops, about sorry. Dr. Kelly, this is a partnership that we'd like to keep going. Um, it's been so beneficial, so we'd like to bring him back. We even, you know, have discussions around, you know, possibly guest speaker for the course. Um, he was very um, mindful of bringing us through, like, positionality and who we are in teaching this course and making sure that representation representation matters. And so I think guest speakers, that's something that we want to um, definitely look into, and Dr. Kelly is an obvious choice for us because he is so engaging. Interestingly enough, he's a former social studies teacher at the high school <laughs> level, so that, um, I think, helps. Better. Right? Yeah. Uh, that helps with um, the connection that we were able to have with him. Uh, and so then the skills and standards connection, uh, you have the AP historical reasoning skills, which any veterans of any AP social studies course, these are very similar. Uh, the first one, applying disciplinary knowledge, uh, essentially your contextualization skills, uh, which the textbook is very useful for. Uh, and also source analysis. Uh, the, the textbook makes a point of utilizing several primary sources and uh, what the purpose and the audience of them were and also uh, doing that throughout the course as well. And then the last one, argumentation, which that is very much kind of tied to the project itself. Students have to research and uh, develop a historical claim, i.e. a thesis. Um, and then have to defend it in front of their students uh, and their, and their uh, their colleague or colleagues, their fellow <laughs> students, uh, ask questions, ask them to defend it. Um, and then from there, it is submitted to College Board uh, to be a part of their AP score. Um, and then for alignment to content standards, I, uh, as I said on the previous slide. So the Learning for Justice Social Justice Standards as well are, um, the course naturally lends itself to these standards and we've been really intentional about incorporating these standards K-5. We're doing the work now to make sure that they're also vertically integrated 612. Um, but we feel like this, the social justice standards, they're divided into four domains, identity, diversity, justice, and action. And we really feel like the justice standard um, is, is where we see this course really the most. Um, we want students to recognize that people are individuals. They are not monoliths, right? So we want to really be um, discussing stereotypes and what that looks like. Um, recognizing injustice and unfairness at all levels of society. Identifying important figures throughout history that led social justice movements. What was their approach? What was their philosophy? So the course is so rich um, in, in content and certainly supports, we, we felt like that anchor standard in particular, the justice anchor standard. I do want to give a special thanks again to Aaron and Laurel Rodman. They've done a tremendous amount of work preparing for this course for next year. They haven't even been even been through the Summer Institute yet, and we have a fully developed course. Um, other districts are calling us to see what we're doing and if we would be willing to collaborate. So it's really kudos to, to that team and um, all of their efforts. Do you have any questions for us? Four members? Uh, not a question, but more of a comment. Um, I can see your excitement, and it's ex you know, as a Pennfield alum, it's ex it's ex a wonderful experience to see that this um, course is happening. Mm -hmm. I wish that I was able to take your course. Mm -hmm. um, and you touched on like just like pos positionality, and so because um, that was one of, was going to be my question, but it sounds like you touched on that. But do you have any? Um, have you guys t thought about maybe how you're planning on maybe addressing any concerns that may arise since this is the first time that this is taught um, and we have had it, different issues um, within the district uh, with race? Um, have you guys talked or got 
support on how you may be proactive yeah. in dealing with if there are anything that comes out of this. We've um, had these, convers these conversations about po positionality and who we are um, mm -hmm. in terms of representation and teaching the course. And so one way to address that is um, we've be been developing a, a letter that we plan to send out to families beforehand okay. that really kind of explains what the course is about, who we are, um, and we actually are going to send that to Dr. Kelly to vet, um, but also the sensitive content that is going to be discussed in this course and how we're going to address it. So there needs to be a protocol um, for, you know, what do we do? prior to these lessons what are we doing you know to be thoughtful as we're teaching these lessons and what does the follow-up look like after and i see that's where a lot of our restorative work comes in um, where we're checking in with kids we're circling up and we're we're having those conversations to, as a, as a check-in yeah yeah i don't know if you wanted to add anything yeah uh just to to ditto um what Dr. Ellen Turner said, I, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited for my kids to take the class one next year and a, the other a few years later. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and I, so I had two questions. One was about, or, or suggestion, one was about having guest speakers uh, recognizing how kind of ironic it is to have a white teacher teaching this. Uh, um, and not that they're not capable of understanding the information but having no personal um skin in the game mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um uh so so i'm glad that you're looking at who to have and and just wondering who will, will the teacher go to for advice mm -hmm. or this question came up and i didn't know how to deal with that do you have somebody in mind that they would yeah. uh, an advisor yeah i think that's where Dr. Kelly comes in certainly for his mentorship and his advisorship, but we also just um, recently learned that College Board is putting out, um, putting forth a mentor program that we can sign up for. So where um, Laurel, who will be teaching the course, she can on a monthly basis meet with a mentor and other teachers of the course so they can sort of debrief and talk about you know, what's coming, sensitive topics, or just have a thought partner in the process. And then of course, you know, I would be supporting as well, and um, you know, Dr. Maloney and Dr. Potter, um, mm -hmm. both of our offices work closely together, um, and we've done some of this work um, around, you know, historically sensitive topics and how do we handle that. But I do think that mentorship piece from Dr. Kelly specifically and from the College Board, I'm so happy that they're offering that, will be huge, a huge help. And 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 kudos to Aaron too because Laurel Rodman is teaching the course. It's a single singleton course that we'll be running, but he has chosen to also go through the training so she has somebody to co-plan with and and have a thought partner in the in the day-to-day -day work and then sorry one one second question um uh, because the text sounds so wonderful mm -hmm. i'm sitting here wishing that every u.s history student that it weren't optional um uh that it were because it's so critical um and i'm wondering if it's possible to take you know, I realize in U.S. history there's a lot of things to, to cover, um, but to take pertinent chapters from this text and interject them in the U.S. history mm -hmm. classes um, so that all students are getting some of this, um, because there's some of it that shouldn't be, well, I, yeah, there's some of it that shouldn't be optional. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, you can't take out the whole U U.S. history text that you're mm -hmm. using now, both for regular and AP, but you can interject some of these chapters for pertinent topics. That's a great, that's an excellent point. I think as we get more familiar with the text, we'll be able to, to figure out what is so critical that we have to make sure that we incorporate it into our U.S. history text and curriculum. We know our U.S. history text falls, it falls short quite right. often yeah I, I figured yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think the chapters for contemporary America yeah. especially would be very useful for that mm -hmm. I have a question mm -hmm. um, where can I get my hand on a book like that <laughs> <laughs> there's one at district office <laughs> just one yeah. and there's one at the public library I think or mm -hmm. will be okay. soon All um, right. but we can All get right. you a copy we'd be happy to do I that. would be very interested 
to read it. And I know I have two graduates of Penfield High School, and um, they would have loved to have done this course, definitely. They did AP History, and um, I, I forget what they did, but I do have an upcoming student, so maybe she'll be interested in this. And I also look forward to College Board bringing out a South Asian diaspora, mm -hmm. um, a Chinese diaspora mm -hmm. course, uh, an island, um, Pacific Islander course, like I could go on and on, right? Because this is, this is what our world is made up of. This is what our country is made mm -hmm. up of. This diversity, us working together, sharing our gifts, right? And thriving in our diversity. And I would like our students to know it all before they get out there, yeah. So when they do get out there in the real world, they're not surprised, yeah. yeah. So thank you for your work. Thank you. I appreciate it. And connect me with College Board. Maybe I can uh, talk to them about the other. <laughs> can I can send you the email. Yeah. <laughs> right, perfect. Thank you. I'm not going to talk so you can talk. Wow. Well, I mean, they already did. But <laughs> I, I, like, I'm so happy that we're getting this, this um, course and just your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Like, if I wasn't already excited, um, just how excited you are. You are both of you, you know, about bringing this and, and working with the teacher who's going to be teaching this. I think it's, it's great. I think I would agree because if you, you know, um, interject some of these topics into um, U.S., then it would get more enthusiasm and more kids interested in this AP course. Um, but thank you so much for just all of your work already. And, you know, it hasn't even, it's not even close to being started yet. So. I, I do just want to point out, <clears throat> I don't like I got your questions, but I'm going to ask you a couple sure. because I think they're easy. But I think it's, it really hits upon what many of the board members talked about with the excitement in this course. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Can you remind me how new this course is in the U.S., like from College Board? Is mm -hmm. this... So last year was the larger pilot, mm -hmm. um, and I believe the year before that was a... It, it was, I think that was the first pilot with a very, very small number of schools. So I believe we're going into year three. 21, 22. So this is the first year that's not a pilot. Yes. Like the, Correct. Next year will be the first year that's not a pilot. Yeah, first year with the exam. With the uh, everything. Yep. And I remember just for, for the board and for the community, uh, a conversation two years ago about could we get into that larger pilot. Mm -hmm. And we made some calls and dug and the answer was no. They had a college board has a number and then once you hit that number like other schools can't get in. So I'm really glad um, you know the, the departments continued to work on this. The, the other question I have is other schools in the area do we know of any that are definitely going to be teaching it next year along with us? Uh, Dr. Kelly told us that uh, Edison Tech is uh, one other that he knows of. Yep. Um, I think that was the only other one, right? Mercy. Oh, Mercy, I'm Mercy. sorry, thank Mercy you. Mercy was in the pilot, yeah. yes. right? Uh, and yeah. I know Fairport is thinking about it, not next school year, but the year after, and so they've reached out to us, interested in what our process mm -hmm. was, and I'm sure they'll want to hear how it's going yeah. um, as we embark on. Those are the, the celebration yeah. pieces in terms of it is, I mean, it's a it's an AP course, there's a lot yep. of work. The training, having you know, been mm -hmm. to AP training for AP World, it, but it's wonderful in terms of the community around of educators for the AP courses. Yep. And then the only other question I have is really just because I'm an AP World History guy. Yeah. So um, I left the district to go to another district to teach AP World because the district I was in would only focus on AP European. AP World, when it first came out with Peter Stearns, was all about 30%. Only 30% could be European history, and I love that. Um, it's shifted a bit over time. I, I think this is awesome. The one thing I'm just trying to wrap my head around is, does so the kids do, the students do a project that's 10% mm -hmm. of their AP score exam yes. score and then that has to get uploaded and sent to college board so yes. we don't grade those they all get graded by committee like the ap exams get get um scored our understanding and and we've read this again and again and again <laughs> i won't hold you to it because it almost seems too good to be true <laughs> yeah. uh our understanding is that using the college board rubric it, it is the teacher oh, that that's scores the wonderful. student that's great Okay. I really hope that stays. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I think so. For 10%, I think so. But it really is, you know, the student, you know, the project they selected, you really be able to, to push that and help them. And, and I know we, we utilize rubrics really well in the social <laughs> studies world. So I have no worry there will be concerns. I, I just think it's incredible. So I'll, I know which classes I'll be popping into. So you can let the teacher know. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
And that concludes special reports. Okay, student reports. Hello. <laughs> um, I have lots of reports for you today, um, starting with district. Right now, approximately three minutes ago, the night of low <laughs> commotion started. Uptown Express from the high school and Midtown Express from the middle school, which are both um, singing groups, um, are performing with singers from Wayne County right now. <laughs> um, next week will be the 53rd annual jazz fundraiser featuring Berkeley graduate Ingrid Jensen. And the Penfield Education Foundation's 5K fundraiser is on April 21st. At PHS, Friday night is junior prom. Lots of friends who are excited about that. It will be held at Eagle Vale Golf Club. The PHS Art Club is holding a sticker fundraiser where proceeds will benefit the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And the Phoenix, the revived creative arts journal, is now accepting multimedia submissions until April 26th. A skilled group of Penfield students recently presented to earn the seal of biliteracy. Obviously the eating area for juniors and seniors <laughs> is now in the library as the commons is being renovated. And today, special education students went on a field trip to the Autism Nature Trail in Letchworth State Park. And after school today, the Chem Club participated in an awesome experiment that included dissolving eggs. Don't ask me what that means because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow at Bay Trail, there will be a strings concert. Uh, the DEI committee at Bay Trail has planned many fest festivities for the month of April to celebrate Deaf History Month, Arab American Heritage Month, Ramadan, and Autism Acceptance Month. Bay Trail held a code of conduct meeting with a student panel who discussed their experiences with the code of conduct. Students can now sign up to attend a Bay Trail performance by the RPO, Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, <laughs> who will play some awesome music and discuss career paths in the field of music. There will also be an optional field trip to the Susan B. Anthony House and Mount Hope Cemetery to learn about women's history. And auditions for the Bay Trail Variety Show are coming up where students can demonstrate talents like singing, drawing, comedy, juggling, or anything else they'd like to show off. At Scribner, published author and retired cobbles teacher Luann Durin came to Scribner to read her book Mrs. Green Loves the Earth to fourth grade classes as a kickoff to an Earth Day research unit. The Scribner Environmental Club will meet with Director of Facilities George English to propose planting a natural pollinator garden at Scribner. At Indian Landing, next Monday, April 22nd, all students K through five will participate in a school-wide march around school grounds in honor of Earth Day. And on April 26th, there will be a birthday celebration to recognize Indian Landing's 75th anniversary where students and faculty can look forward to games, drawing, history, and food. And at Harris Hill, registration is open for the Harris Hill Bingo Night, which is being held on, also on April 26th, where popcorn and be beverages will be provided. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. OK. <coughs> Superintendent's report. Helen, I'm so excited that I only have two things to share, and you didn't <laughs> say either of them. The first time, I think. So, but yeah, it was wonderful. Um, I just have uh, for student, I have a cup, just two um, student staff honors, and then uh, I have an update in uh, the Penfield Central School District update, which is on UPK, um, uh, pre kindergarten. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffel for business updates focused on primarily our budget for the 24 25 school year. So uh, first is mock trial team. So congratulations to the uh, Penfield High School mock trial team on winning the county finals versus Brighton. And why this is cool is this is the first time ever that Penfield uh, has won the finals. Uh, they lost to Brighton last year in, in the finals and won this year. And so the team will now move on to the next level of competition, which is in Buffalo. Uh, there's no date set for that. It'll be a Saturday and they go against uh, whoever wins the Buffalo area mock trial. Um, very cool. 
And then uh, we, once again, um, really excited to be named a Best Community for Music Education. If you wonder why, go back and listen to Helen because she talked about some amazing musical things that are happening in Penfield. And this is the 15th year that the National Association of Music Merchants, NAM Foundation, has named Penfield Central School District one of the best communities for music, music education. And I think you walk into um, anywhere and uh, with music playing in the auditorium, all of our concerts, but especially at the high school when you see students who started potentially in Suzuki in first grade and all the way up, um, just some incredible talent and hard, hard work. So thank you to our musical students but also to our incredible music educators. <clears throat> I'll uh, have a really just one slide I want to talk through um, um, Penfield Universal pre-kindergarten for next year 2024 and 2025. Um, before I kind of go through just a couple of questions and answers just as a reminder for the for the community the board's aware is this is actually only our second year um, offering a UPK and we utilize state dollars to do that. <clears throat> it is, uh, we've been able to last year and this year um, find 116 spots. So there is a lottery that we have to follow New York State Education um, um, protocols for that. It's very up and up. There's no, you can't say certain kids get in first. It's, it's a pure lottery. Um, and uh, we are late with opening enrollment. Um, families who have a student entering UPK have seen a couple of letters of, uh, out of my office. Um, the district is um, late with open enrollment this year uh, because we solicited requests for proposals, RFPs, with the hopes of additional community-based organizations they would partner with the district. And there are required steps to this process which take time to complete. So just remind folks that that last year, our first year venturing into UPK, um, we utilized one CBO, which was the Bayview YMCA. They were wonderful. Ultimately, um, they were asking, I understand, but for more, more funding. And really, we utilized um, the uh, funding from the state. And so over time, we shifted. We didn't lose any spots going into this year. But now as we're looking, um, the current status right now is that when we are looking, we thought we had one other group. I will just give kudos to Mary Sapone, who you met earlier, um, who does so much for us with UPK. But she's talked to uh, over 35 um, uh, CBOs over the last couple of years trying to get people interested to host our UPK program. Um, in their community-based organization. Not everybody jumps at that for lots of different reasons. Um, you know, their buildings do have to be up to par for New York State Education Department approval, and there are things that they need to do uh, in, order to, in order to accept UPK students from Penfield, but it is not without calling uh, quite a few places. And um, our current status now, I, I can say, is right now that we're currently finalizing contracts. We have a, a, a number of verbal agreements. Again, lots of phone calls, a lot of work from, from Mary Sapone and many others. Um, so right now, we're, we're tentatively planned for 90 students next school year. So it is down from the 116 we've been able to have, but it's also you know not zero, which we were worried and trying to be as transparent as possible, getting that information out before break that we could potentially have zero UPK spots, which is heartbreaking. I can speak for the board, I can speak for the district, not what we wanted to um, have to deal with at this late juncture. So the question we've received, so we're really hopeful that uh, pretty soon we'll be able to release that we can, we can take 90 placements. We're still working on that right now. Um, one of the questions we've received, which is a great question, which is why aren't we putting our UPK in the Penfield schools? Um, and if you happen to have an elementary school child and you come into our schools, you will probably notice that there are no empty classrooms waiting for students. Um, we're not that far away uh, from a completed capital project, which added 12 classrooms to our elementary schools, four at Indian Landing, four at Harris Hill, four at, nope, four at Indian Landing, four at Scribner, four at Cobbles, and um, those are already filled with student classes. So we don't have enough space to bring it in-house. Um, if and when we bring it in-house, the cost of that program will go up because it will be Penfield staff teaching it versus um, sort of farming it out to a community-based organization. So we are 
that is one of our plans. I can talk is that we've had conversations on what do we need to do if we want to make UPK something that is just a given in Penfield, we really need to secure space. Uh, that does take time. Um, we are currently, if you have follow our capital project planning. We're still working on what's referred to as the 2021 transportation facility capital project. So it's 2024. We're still working on that. Um, I like to say that if, if you're not aware of, of how buildings work in New York State public schools, we have to get all the approval through SED. Whereas a home builder can build a house in about three months. It takes us much longer because we don't just have to get the town to approve, we have to get everything approved through the facilities department at New York State Education Department. I don't know if you're aware, but they don't always pick up their phone. Um, so we, there's a lot of work and a, and a lot of support there. But that is something we are absolutely having conversations about. <clears throat> um, so really it's around the lack of space in our buildings. So when will enrollment for UPK open for families? Uh, as soon as the contracts are uh, signed, uh, we will be opening enrollment. So we really hope and believe we can get this done before May 1st. We do need to have those contracts ultimately approved by the board, um, but the board has been very supportive around UPK and the work around these contracts. So we believe that if we have the contracts, although not a approved yet by the board, but signed by both parties, we should be able to move forward with the enrollment, just not be able to share, you know, maybe where you are going or where you've been selected until we get the board to approve our contracts. Um, and, you know, we really truly recognize um, um, how challenging this is for families. Uh, UPK, and I just state for the board, my team, and the public, I always feel a little silly saying UPK because the U stands for universal, but it is not universal. It's a, that, that term comes from New York State. <clears throat> they would love it to be universal, but we also need funding to make that a reality. Um, and so right now we are working, as I said, in uh, uh, finalizing our contracts with, uh, a, it would be hopefully a total of four um, CBOs owned by two different uh, entities and we're working on getting those finalized um, so we can share more information out with our families. Um, we are also looking at the potential for increasing funding. So a lot of times, I, I think back, I can't believe I'm gonna say this out loud, but I think back to COVID in the sense that the district had to make decisions based on New York State requirements. And so I always will take you know um, people upset, but sometimes you know our hands were tied on what we could and couldn't do. And, and similar here is the funding sources. So, you know, we are going to continue to advocate. I will give a shout out to Assemblyperson Jen Lunsford, who's been uh, incredible working and in trying to advocate for the state to increase their funding per pupil, which would be huge. Um, and so we continue to work on that, continue to work on long term and continue immediately now trying to make sure that we can secure as many spots as possible for the 2024 2025 school year. And again, when we put information out, even when it's not good, like we might not have a UPK program, we know that that message is not going to make anybody happy. We, we know that, but we also feel that we got to get that information out um, um, to be transparent. And we really appreciate families who have reached out to the board, to myself, to Mary Sapone. Uh, we hear you and we continue to work on what we can do to uh, ensure that UPK uh, stays in Penfield and, and potentially is able to reach more students through this process. Any questions from the board? I don't have a question, just sure. a comment. I just think it's really important for our community to know that we receive, is it $5,400 from the state? Is that yeah. the correct amount? Yeah. And part of the dilemma or difficulty getting our CBOs to agree is they want more money. Mm -hmm. And we yep. can only pay what the state is allowing us to pay. Yeah, so we're allowed so to, and we've talked about this, we are allowed to, you know, there are districts who have, typically districts who have brought it in-house, who have utilized general funds to cover the difference. And, uh, you know, that's why I mentioned earlier is that, that I say if and when, because but we really are, are dedicated to focus at UPK as a conversation we have had 
uh, quite a lot. I believe Dr. Maloney would have already built one if she could uh, build the UPK Center. So um, it takes time, but we hear it. Um, you know, when we started it, so I, I share that, that yes, the, the board could pull or, you know, the district could and the board could elect to use general funds. Um, and we, we know we will need to do that when we're able to bring it in-house. Um, and, and it's tough when, not, when it's not offered, when it's not really universal. So it is the $5,400. We are looking at, there are some, you know, potential uh, abilities down the road uh, in terms of finding uh, increasing um, funding source. And so um, you know, there's some information we're still trying to dig into around being able to get extra money. Our understanding from working with the state was that we could have applied for something that would have allowed us more money, but not more per pupil. And so that's what we're trying to work out. There are some districts, which makes it, um, I think the reality is difficult, is the CBOs now are not necessarily owned by like one family who's running an in-house preschool or daycare, but it is, you know, they own many. Um, and so, and there are some districts due to their wealth ratio that they're able to offer more money per student. We don't fall in that to make it easy, but it is something we're continuing to look, sort of, sort of um, leave no rock unturned on what we can do to support uh, the UPK program. And it's interesting, you know, history is always fun in the sense that there was, we've been talking about UPK and running UPK for about six years. And so it took time to really work it out. Mary Sapone is absolutely amazing because she is relentless in a good way with calling the state and finding out every avenue we can and really, and really pushed. And so we now have had two years in and um, you know I'm a silver lining. So the fact that all of a sudden we might not be able to do it and the number of people who came out is great because it really is that sort of my shark tank term would be proof of concept right like this is working this this is something our community wants and we need to keep digging in to make sure that we can ensure that it it, it is um, uh, hopefully one day pure actually universal but in the meantime making sure that we have um, every dollar from the state upk that we use um, and that money is really tied up in a grant so we you know apply for it so it's not like money it is the state will take it back and use it for something else if we don't use the UPK uh, funding. But um, you know we don't want to we don't want to leave money on the table if we can help it. So I think that's I just want to kind of go over there's a lot there. Yeah. One question: Could you share with the community um, the names of the CBOs that yeah. that we're pairing that we're partnering with? Yeah. So it's Carolot, and I, I had to look at my phone a friend in the audience. So it's Carolot and then Inspire. <laughs> So we're looking at two different sites, two are owned by Carolot and two are owned by Inspire. And we're working, we're working through that now. So four sites. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, four, four sites. Four sites, two, two companies. Ones. Two, yeah, two Carolot, two Inspire. Two partners, yes, yep. two and two. Yeah, thank you. So um, those are the, the ones we're working on now. Um, and are they situated all throughout Penfield? They are, uh, there is no, requirement that the CBO has to be within the district boundaries okay so there are some that are and there are some that are not okay there are a number of and I won't use the names here but there are a number of um, potential CBOs mm -hmm. you know private uh, uh, preschools in our area that they're just not interested now we you know we have called we meaning Mary Sapone has called many many times and you know they, they might be interested one of the reasons we opened the RFP process again this year is because we thought we had another um, uh, pre preschool daycare that was interested and then they ended up not submitting um, the proposal and so that did slow us down but we were hopeful we were going to have a, another one and it's a it's a big ask it's a big undertaking um, for for a um, preschool or daycare site to take that on but um, we partner, we provide meals, we provide curriculum, we provide support. Um, but ideally, in a perfect world, having UPK in-house means that it's, you know, uh, Penfield staff hired to support. And ideally, that, that is, I think that would be the best for consistency. We know the turnover rate. I have a kindergartner. If you've got little kids who've been in, in daycare or preschool, you know that the turnover rate many times um, is pretty ho much higher than uh, a public school, especially Penfield. We don't see a lot of turnover with staff. Um, and so that's something that we are continuing to work on. You're welcome. Anyone else? 
I would just say the last thing is uh, folks who are listening who maybe have a preschool age child for next year or even in two years, when we send out the census and ask families in the community to fill it out, that's how we know that you have a future preschooler in your house and that's where you, we get you into our system so you can get emails and messages so always encourage folks to you know let us know if you've got little ones in the house so we can it helps us plan for enrollment projections but also helps to know who we send information to because um, like a UPK letter didn't go out to every parent because we really want to hit the people that we knew would be um, you know utilizing UPK potentially thank you and I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffel <clears throat> Thanks, Dr. Putnam. You're welcome. Good evening, board. I have some business updates for you tonight. Um, firstly, and kind of chiefly here, we'll review our budget development uh, with regards to the state budget status, our proposed 24-25 uh, budget with those supporting revenues, uh, and take a look at a preliminary local funding impact with regards to the tax levy and projected tax rates. And then on your agenda packet this evening, uh, we need to approve project change orders, both for the 2021 capital project that Dr. Putnam mentioned earlier, that's a small one, and then the stimulus funded project over at Indian Landing for the HVAC. There were some design changes that the teachers requested. So there's some changes um, for your approval tonight. <clears throat> we have that superintendent's proposed budget for you to approve. We also need to approve the property tax report card. I'm not gonna go into the property tax report card, but this is now an annual requirement whereby we have to list what the uh, budget is, what the anticipated levy is going to be, what the projected enrollment is, what all of our anticipated year end fund balance figures are, and what the plans are for certain reserves for next year. Uh, we have to submit that to the state within 24 hours of your approval, so that's something we'll be doing tomorrow. And then we also need to approve all of the election officials for that May 21st vote date. <clears throat> so budget development process, I'm sure you're getting sick of seeing this chart, but we are now at the, um, you know, we're at the beginning of the end here. Uh, so most of these uh, to-do things are, are green. We're giving you a proposed budget tonight. We're amidst those legal requirements around uh, legal notices and the hearing date, things like that. Um, public budget notice being fully online. Um, and then uh, here it is. So uh, not a lot of changes from the meeting that we had at the end of March before spring break. The final proposed budget for next year comes to $119 million, 681725 uh, So it's a $2.7 million increase or 2.36%. I think at our last meeting we were at 2.37, so very close to where we were last time. Um, again, those kind of major cost drivers that we've discussed over and over in the 21 and 22 functions around the increased staffing for our, our faculty as we built out that integrated co-taught teaching program that we heard about earlier. Uh, obviously, employee benefits increasing quite a bit. And then the other big story of this budget is all that debt service money falling off, that $4.5 million decrease there. So the other way to slice uh, the proposed budget is by object, that was function. Um, so the thing that jumps out right away is that wages and benefits make up about three quarters of our budget. Uh, so we always say education is a, a people business. Um, and you know, I think in the last couple of years, we learned that we want it to be a people business and that's where we do best and where we thrive. Um, the next biggest budget line uh, is our BOCES budget that makes up 13% of the budget. Uh, then contractual costs, so that's costs for all outside services, utilities, gasoline, professional development, things like that, is 8% of the budget. Equipment and materials is 3% of the budget. Debt service is 1% of the budget. And then interfund transfers, um, $230,000 next year, partially goes towards the school lunch fund and partially goes toward the special aid fund to cover the cost of those special education services over the summer. Um, and again, you can kind of see where those major cost drivers are. The other thing that we have to do um, when we adapt the budget is look at the three-part component analysis of our budget. So this is administrative costs, programmatic costs, and capital costs. You can see where we are in the current 23-24 year uh, and then the proration of spending within this year's budget and where we're going to be next year. Uh, and then the year-over-year -year differences, both in dollars and percentage. Uh, so you can see the administrative costs are increasing about $500,000. The programmatic costs increasing just under $6.5 million. And capital decreasing $4.1 million. 
Uh, again, that's where the debt service dollars come from, that decrease there. So you can see that as a proration of spending, administrative costs are basically the same year over year. The decrease in cost for capital essentially gets shifted over to the programming side of it. Um, so 10.14% on administrative costs, program costs a little over 80%, and capital a little under 10% there. Uh, so I had hoped to have more information about the New York State budget, uh, but we don't have a New York State budget yet. Um, there has been multiple extenders. There was a press conference yesterday afternoon with the governor where they have a conceptual framework of a budget. Um, uh, currently, the latest budget extender goes to Thursday. Um, tomorrow was the last scheduled day of the legislative session for another couple weeks because Passover is about to start and they take a two-week recess. Um, so we don't have any information uh, about what this is going to look like. So for purposes of our revenue budget, we're still going with the governor's numbers that she had proposed back in January, which, if you believe the reporting, is probably what we're going to get. Uh, it looks like they have backed off that hold harmless provision that hurt so many districts in the state, but it didn't really affect us. And it does look like they're holding on to that inflationary uh, factor adjustment that she had proposed. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to share uh, any budget impacts as it relates to dollars or policy at our budget hearing in a couple weeks. You know, I know at our last meeting we talked about school meals and BOCES reimbursement and all these other um, really nice things, UPK funding. Uh, but we don't have any information on that tonight. So at this point, it's just kind of status quo. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, on the uh, education funding side, um, we're just going with the governor's uh, numbers. We're sticking with that 3.29% on the levy. Um, county sales tax, we haven't changed. All the revenue, we haven't changed. And the assigned fund balance that we discussed a couple meetings ago um, presents us you know, the balanced budget here, again, at that 2.7%. Uh, Six million dollar increase, or 2.36 percent year over year. Uh, I did just want to touch a little bit on the levy. Um, so, in the tax cap era, since the laws of 2011 went into effect, you can see on the left hand side each year what the levy cap was. The levy cap, as a reminder, is what we're allowed as a taxing jurisdiction to levy as a percentage. Uh, that would only require 50 percent voter approval. You can see in every year since that 20. Uh, 12, 13 year, uh, Penfield has been under the cap. In two of the last three years, we were at 0% on the levy. And you can see that this year, um, you know, we're still significantly under at 3.29%. Uh, the average for this over the last 12 years is about 3% on the levy cap and about 2% actually on the levy. Um, so the levy cap this year, as we've discussed, is at 4.56%, and the levy itself is going to be 3.29%. So for community approval, we just need 50% of voters to say yes to the budget. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how tax rates come from our decision to adopt the tax levy. So the tax levy at 3.29% is the first step. Uh, at that point, we need to get town assessments. We have six towns in Penfield, as a reminder, across two different counties. Uh, two different counties share different sales taxes, and by state law, the sales taxes are an offset to the levy, so it gets a little confusing there. And then I know we always like to uh, discuss the New York State equalization rates, uh, which, which we'll touch on in a moment, um, which gets us to our tax rates. As a reminder, the board doesn't actually adopt tax rates until August, so things will change um, with these forthcoming projections. I've shown this infographic in years past because I think it's helpful. Um, so, like I said, Penfield Central has six towns in our community. If you look at this example, you have a house in town A, let's call that Brighton. Um, you have a house in town B, let's call that Penfield. Both of the houses on the open market would sell for a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000 each. The house in Brighton is assessed at $185,000, but the assessor in Penfield has assessed that house at $250,000. So at that point, when you have multiple towns, the state steps in with their equalization rate, whereby they determine what the assessment ratio is compared to what they believe the perceived market value is. So you can see the equalization rate in town A is all the way down to 74% as the state believes that that house is underassessed, whereas the equalization rate in town B is at 100%. The full market value on the open market uh, equals, in theory, the assessed value. So then you can see that the town tax rates are quite different. That town A has a $27.03 uh, per uh, $1,000 of assessed value tax rate, 
and the house in town B has a $20 um, tax rate. But both of the houses are paying the exact same amount um, on their school bill. So I think this is a, a useful exercise to go through every year because you know, how we calculate tax rates I think can be nebulous. Anybody's always welcome to contact my office if they have questions about their tax bill or um, their assessments and I can help them walk through their different options. So within that, at our last meeting, we talked about what the tentative equalization rates were gonna be for this 24-25 year. And you can see that all six of our towns are once again decreasing. Um, and this is a continuation of the last couple of years and this is a reflection of a still hot housing market. Um, where market values of houses are outpacing increases in assessments. So within those decreases in equalization rates, we can see what the projected rates are for next year. Uh, I do have an asterisk on the slide because this will change many more times before the board adopts the tax warrant in August. Uh, you can see Penfield would increase a little over 2%, Parrington would have an 8% bump, uh, Pittsburgh 3%, Brighton a little under 2%, Mastodon and Walworth around 6%. Uh, the, uh, the line that I always go to is the true value tax rate. <clears throat> so this is the calculation that if all six of the towns were at 100% of their equalization, what the true value tax rate would be for Penfield Central. And you can see next year that would be dropping a dollar per $1,000 of assessed value or 5.4%. And that's a continuation, uh, a trend that we've seen in the last, you know, handful of years here. So if we go back six, seven years, the true value tax rate for Penfield was over $25 for multiple years. And next year, it's projected to be all the way down under $18. So this is a reflection of two things. One, those you know, big drops in equalization rate is a reflection of the increases in market value of homes, uh, but then also us being under our cap the last you know, so many years, driving down that tax rate a bit. So we will have much more information um, coming up. So those board member petitions are due next Monday at five o'clock um, to the district clerk, Mrs. Astro. Uh, the full budget packet will be available online and in our buildings um, by April 30th. Uh, so this includes all of the salary disclosures, all the tax abatement things, the school report cards, the financial transparency reports. Uh, Meet the candidates night will also be held on that Tuesday, April 30th. Our budget hearing, uh, which will fully review the whole scope of our budget development process over the last six months, is on May 7th here at PHS at 6.30. Um, after that, the budget notice is mailed out to all members in the community. And the statewide vote and board election, uh, third Tuesday in May, this year, May 21st, uh, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. here at um, PHS over in the gymnasium. So. Any questions with regard to the budget or any of the action items tonight? I know we've talked a lot about budget. I appreciate your patience. Um, but I know it's something, you know, the, the community at large is always very interested in, and I appreciate us taking the time to, to go through it. Board members' questions or comments? No, I don't have any either. Thank you so much. Because you did a great job. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why. Yeah. I always like to point out, and I know you did, is that the equalization rates are set by New York State. New York State. Yep. So that equalization rate is not the district. They tell us what the equalization rates are. Yep, that comes from the Department of Tax and Finances. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> that concludes superintendent reports. Okay, public comment. So we have speakers tonight. So I just want to go over a few one things. Light, one thing. 5A. Oh, how do I keep missing everything? You know, because we don't I was usually have that in there. Thinking America. about that, yes. All right. So, thank you. Can I please have a motion and a second that the Board of Education authorizes the Board of Education President as an alternate to designate and approve impartial hearing officers during 2023 2024 school year? So moved. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Now, public comments? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so any individual that is registered to speak or signed up to speak has three minutes. Um, I will recognize you to come up. Once the three minutes is up, please, you will hear a ding, um, <laughs> a chime, ding. Um, uh, uh, no. <laughs> I'm talking some. to middle schoolers right now. I'm sorry. I'm still in that mode. Um, 
And we, ju I just ask that you finish your, your thought um, and that you understand that um, any questions or comments that you pose, um, the board is not going to respond. Um, the superintendent will um, provide a, a written response for you. Um, and that is pretty much it. So we have, and please correct me if I mispronounce your name, um, Megan Westbrook Burnham. Oh, yeah, no. You can come right up. I'm sorry. You can come right up to that. You don't have to worry about the clicker, but you got a microphone. Great. <laughs> um, am I able to just start? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share our family's concerns. Um, I've definitely heard the board, um, you know, and the people from the district share that UPK has been a concern for everyone. Um, you know, we recognize that. I was able to meet with Dr. Potter and Dr. Maloney last week, which I greatly appreciated. Um, you know, my husband and I have two children in the Headfield School District. Our, our daughter's in first grade and our son is four. So we were really looking forward to being able to apply for UPK for him this fall. Um, as a parent, it's so disappointing that our son may not even have the chance to be in this lottery. Um, you know, it's, I understand that that's, uh, the UPK is a structure that the state uses. It's not available to every student in most districts in this area. Um, it was a huge surprise to me when my daughter was born because other, you know, in Erie County, for example, um, they do have a preschool for every kid in the district. And it would be great to get to that point. Um, obviously, that's not where it is right now. Um, but our daughter didn't get to participate because she was in kindergarten when the program started. Um, now that our son may not, because there's a question about whether there will be enough locations for this fall, is really challenging for our family. The fact that circumstances have prevented the applications from even going out to families at this point is an incredible hardship because many programs are full at this point. Many programs have wait lists and if you don't know what's available, it's very difficult to be making those choices as a parent and we're talking about something that is supposed to start in September. My husband and I both work, so we have to have care for our four-year-old son. Our son is currently going to Browncroft, which is one of the Carolot locations that will be participating. That being said, they haven't been able to say to parents what's going to be available for students for this fall because they haven't known. And they still have not been able to confirm that they will have places for kids who are not lottery winners. And that's, again, our family. I mean, I understand we're affected a little bit more than most because our son goes to Browncroft, but it just creates a lot of difficulty not knowing and not even knowing if the care that we have had in place since he was born is gonna be able to continue because of this uncertainty about the UPK program. The other thing I wanted to share is just the communication. Um, I understand things happen, um, but the fact that that notice in March did not go out to all parents and then no notice follow-up to parents who had Yahoo email accounts in particular was actually sent was another disappointment. If that happens where there's a problem with the communication that goes out to families, I feel like the district should send an, an additional communication, especially to those families who didn't get that update. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Audrey Leites. Did 
I pronounce it correctly? You did actually. Oh, yeah, fantastic. great job. <laughs> Thank Good you. Job. Uh, my name is Audrey Leitez. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity um, to speak. I would also like to discuss Penfield's UPK program. Um, firstly, I do thank Dr. Putnam for the update. Um, that was great news to hear that they have even more spots than was previously communicated, well anticipated. Um, and I, I am going to echo a lot of his comments um, generally. So I think the UPK program is very important to our children and families in the district. Um, as some of you may know, um, private preschool is very expensive and as Megan just communicated, local spots are extremely competitive um, with year plus waiting lists. Um, the academic, social, emotional, so social, emotional, and equitable access um, facets of preschool education are well documented with the rigor expected of our children in kindergarten, as well as recent economic financial strains on families. I think this is a very important um, program that the district continue to work to offer. Um, locally, many peer districts in the county are also offering this. Um, either through the community-based organizations, the CBOs, um, in-house, or a combination of both. Um, that includes Fairport and Webster, for example. Um, I do urge the district to continue working to secure the contracts with the CBOs for the coming academic year, um, to push for as many spots as possible, and also to continue to work with legislative support, um, like Representative Lunsford. Um, and then long term, I do think the district should continue to work internally to secure the program's future. Um, contracting with the CBOs seems difficult and unpredictable, um, so I think kind of an in-house option or a combination of that um, would better enable the program's future success. Um, and I do think the um, support from the community for this program highlights that maybe we should also consider um, budgetary fu funds from Penfield directly um, to be used <coughs> for this program. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Gardner. Hi, thank you um, so much for taking the time tonight. Um, I do just want to, I guess, express my continued concern and confusion just regarding the district's response to the racist um, violent threats that were made in February. Um, I have in front of me um, the, I guess, message on Parent Square that was put out on March 28th by uh, Dr. Putnam there and I think that it probably refers to the incident that I'm talking about. I can't be for you know certain because it doesn't specify much. Um, but I, I think that the district needs to be clear with the parents and the community about what happened and what your investigation looked like. Because as far as I know, you still don't know who the intended victim is. And that's really shameful. I understand that, you know, as you stated, Dr. Putnam, that you're obligated to follow the laws and guidelines when considering the information we're able to share about the specific incidents and our students. But you can share information about what an investigation looks like. Um, you cite DASA, that's your response, to, to cite policy. Um, and as a parent who has a child who's been on the receiving end of a DASA report, I can say that when I experienced that as a parent, I was really shocked that nothing, there's no follow-up. Um, there was nothing. It was, hey, this is what happened. It was addressed in the classroom. And thankfully, I have such trust in the teachers at Indian Landing and our principal. So I can trust that, yes, it was handled in the classroom. 
but I can't say that for, you know, how this was handled on the bus um, or speak for any of the teachers or principals at the high school. And I don't know that it was handled. What have you guys done to find the student? Have you checked with all students that may have been impacted? Have you told all of their parents exactly what happened, the language that was used? Because I, I, don't, I don't know or trust that you have. And I think I know that the board, I know you're not responsible for the day to day in and out, but this is too important. And when we have our superintendent defaulting to policy, you guys are in on the policy making. Um, and with communications with the superintendent. So I hope that more can be done and you know our students deserve more. That's all. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Sherry Mentor. So I have to prepare something for today. I don't really like public speaking, but I felt this was important to bring up. So good evening. My name is Sherry Mentor. Um, five years ago, my family made the decision to move to Rochester. At the time, I was concerned about the lack of diversity, but hopeful about the opportunities my son would have. However, as time has passed, it has become painfully clear that our community is grappling with deep-rooted issues of representation and diversity. The recent racist incident communicated to us via Parent Square in February of this year cannot be brushed aside with trite non-apologies or empty promises. We must acknowledge the harsh reality that exists within our school and take meaningful action, action to address it head on. As parents and community members, it is our responsibility to ensure that every child within our school district feels safe, valued, and respected. Yet the truth is that many of our children are being failed by a system that perpetuates inequality and injustice. We can't continue to pay lip service to the ideals of diversity and inclusion while failing to confront the systemic barriers that prevent so many from fully particip participating in our schools. It is not enough to simply condemn acts of racism when they occur. We must actively work to dismantle the systems and structures that enable such behavior to thrive. This requires a commitment to examining our own biases, challenging discriminatory practices, and actively promoting equity and justice within our schools and neighborhoods. As parents, we have a unique opportunity and responsibility to lead by example. We must hold ourselves and our fellow community members accountable for our actions and ensure that our words are backed by meaningful deeds. This means listening to the voices of those who have been marginalized or silenced, amplifying their concerns and working collaboratively to address them. Moreover, it means rejecting the temptation to sweep uncomfortable truths under the rug in favor of maintaining the status quo. True progress requires discomfort, sacrifice, and unwillingness to confront the hard truths about ourselves and our society. But it's only by doing so that we can truly create a community where every child has the opportunity to thrive. As an actionable next step, I would like to propose a comprehensive review of the curriculum across all grade levels to ensure that it accurately reflects the diversity of our student body and incorporates perspectives from diverse cultures, backgrounds, and identities. Change will not happen overnight, but with sustained and ongoing commitment, we will see a difference. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. We are on 7A change orders. May I have a motion and a second that the change orders that are described be approved? So moved. Second. <coughs> All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. <coughs> May I have a motion and a second that the budget for the 2024-25 school year be submitted to the voters for approval on May 21st, 2024, in the amount of $119,681,725. So moved. Second. 
All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Be it resolved that the Penfield Central School District Board of Education approve the 2024-25 property tax report as presented. Be it further resolved that the Assistant Superintendent for Business and Finance is directed to submit the property tax report card to the State Education Department by the end of the next business day following this approval. May I please have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approves the 2024-25 property tax report card as presented. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. The following candidates have been nominated for their or by their respective boards for positions as members of the BOCES board. It has been past practice for component boards of education to endorse the candidate nominated by the Board of Education whose seat is up for election. Seat one resolved to cast one vote for the election of Margaret Burns, resident of West Arundaquit Central School District. As a member of the Monroe BOCES 1 board for a term of office, which begins on July 1st, 2024 and ends June 30th, 2027. Seat 2 resolved to cast one vote for the election of Mark Kokanovic, a resident of the Brighton Central School District, as a member of the Monroe 1 BOCES board for a term of office, which begins July 1st, 2024, and ends June 30th, 2027. Seat three, resolved to cast the one vote for the election of Tom Nespeka, resident of the Webster Central School District, as a member of the Monroe One BOCES board for a term of office, which begins on July 1st, 2024, and ends on June 30th, 2027. Seat four, resolved to cast one vote for the election of Maureen Nupp, resident of the Fairport Central School District as a member of the Monroe One BOCES Board for a term of office, which begins on July 1st, 2024, and ends June 30th, 2027. Mm -hmm. Lastly, seat five resolved to cast one vote for the election of Nancy Semo, resident of the East Arundaquit Central School District as a member of the Monroe One BOCES Board for a term of which will begin on July 1st, 2024 and end June 30th, 2027. May I please have a motion and a second that the Board of Education cast one vote for election of each candidate as a member of the Monroe One BOCES Board. So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. May I please have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approves the proposed BOCES administrative budget in the amount of $5,820,485 for the 2024-25 fiscal year. So moved. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Policies for first read, we have 3280, community use of public school facilities, 3280, regulation, use of school facilities, and 3280, regulation point one, uh, user fees. I will. Would you like to speak to those? Absolutely. <laughs> so just as a reminder, <laughs> the board's aware, but for the community, <coughs> the, board's require, the board's required to approve um, policies, the regulations is, so the policy typically is the what, and then the regulation is how it's going to get done. <clears throat> but we always bring regulations to the board as well for the community to review. So this um, policy, 3280, and the regulations that go with it is our community use of public school facilities, also known as facilities use. We have incredible taxpayer dollar uh, facilities. We want to partner with uh, community in order to utilize those, but we haven't touched this policy in any real manner for a long time. And so it used to be one policy and six regulations, Dr. Driffle. 
and so we really tried to um, um, scale back and, and really focus on uh, re reviewing it. We've done an audit on, on the facilities use and a lot of work from the business office. So you'll see a lot of changes in there. There are some increases to our fee schedule. I encourage folks to look at. Um, there's also, we removed, we used to have an application fee. So to apply to use our space, you'd pay an application fee. We, we've taken that application fee out, um, but uh, encourage folks to take a look at that. And uh, policies that are first read uh, will remain in uh, up online for folks to review and uh, share feedback with our district clerk, Mrs. Zastro. Um, and then the policy committee will meet again before it comes to second read at the next meeting in May. Okay, policy for approval. Can I have a motion and a second that the above policy, 1640 absentee military and early mail ballots um, be approved as presented? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed? May I have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approves Megan Doriti, Esquire, as chairperson <laughs> of election for the May, 20, uh, May 21, 2024 budget vote and election. So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. And may I have a motion and a second that the board approves Kathleen Zastro as chief election inspector for the May 21st, 2024 budget vote and election. So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. And may I have a motion and a second that the board approves the individuals named above to serve as election inspectors and assistant clerks at the May 21st, 2024 budget vote and election. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Um, you'll see next that we have the draft schedule for next year's um, meetings. Does anyone have any comments? So workshops have been added instead of two board meetings. Um, some have been replaced with workshops, which I think would be very beneficial. Um, okay, and that's it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Monroe County School <laughs> Board's committee meetings, um, labor relations, oh, Mark, Mark is yeah. not here. And then um, did anyone else go to labor relations? <laughs> I I, uh, I can't remember what the topic was. <laughs> I apologize, and I, I should have checked, but I don't think I was there. I don't think any of us went to that one. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, okay. Mark was there, but we weren't. Yeah. Well, maybe he can present next, next time. Board meeting. <laughs> All right. Um, legislative committee, Nicole. Yeah. Um, at this this last time, um, Adrian Hale from the Board of Regents was there. Um, and the meeting went long and I had to leave, but uh, I was there, I think, for most of it. Um, so he talked a lot about my brother's keeper, um, which I don't think we have it in Penfield. Yeah. Um, that's about closing the achievement gap for men of color. Um, he talked about that for that, as well as general, he would like to see districts, not just looking at graduation rates, as a sign of success because graduation alone doesn't determine future success. Um, he talked a lot about technology, chat, the fame, you know, we oft talked about chat GPT and teaching kids to use that in an ethical way. And then there was a lot of talk about mental health. Um, and <clears throat> I found myself agreeing with two of the main things that came out was um, sort of low-hanging fruit you know when you know we've talked a lot about mental health and hiring um, more mental health professionals which is important and good and right but 
Then there's a couple of things that are low-hanging fruit with lots of, uh, of research behind them. And uh, a couple of people talked about them, and one of which is the use of digital devices. And, and I thought it was interesting that on the, in the onboard newspaper that we got, uh, sort of echoed the comments, um, just that more districts are banning cell phone use. And um, I just said a hearty amen in my kitchen, <laughs> you know, just because, um, you know, again, low hanging fruit, you know, everybody who, who has a, who has a brain understands that social media is, has a negative impact on kids and we can't control what happens outside of school, but if kids are off of their devices for seven or eight hours a day, that could only be a good thing. And so, you know, some people talk, well, that, that article talked about, and then some people at the meeting talked about just the pushback that will surely come even from teachers who are used to saying, when you're done with your work, pull out your phone. And I found myself saying, thinking, what happened to when you're done with your work, pull out a book? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, we're a school. Um, so I think, and, and also parents, in, including myself, will have to be retrained like you don't have access to your kid. I mean, they don't have access to their elementary and, and middle school kids now, but high school kids, you won't have access to them all the time. But none of us grew up with our parents having access to us in school, and we all grew up. Um, so <laughs> so um, I think it's, again, low-hanging fruit. I think it's silly to talk about mental health without talking about this. And the other piece of low-hanging fruit, which I gave another hearty amen, as, as you know, I've talked about it myself, which is later start times for high school students, that anybody uh, who has done any research at all talks about uh, circadian rhythms changing for teenagers, and teenagers naturally fall asleep later and want to wake up later. It's not because they're lazy, it's because that's what their body does and that teenagers need eight to 10 hours of sleep, and that's impossible um, unless they fall asleep at 8 p.m., <laughs> um, which no teenager will. So, um, so we're doing it backwards in that little kids naturally wake up early and go to bed early, and our schools start later for little kids. So I, again, I just think it is foolish to talk about mental health without addressing these two bits of low-hanging fruit. Um, and that was talked about a lot, so I know I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. I'll just share, uh, I had the superintendent uh, county meeting on Friday, so that came up, uh, the a review of the legislative committee and, and Regent Hale, um, and who was a speaker last year at an event we went to, it was great. Um, he's a talker, so, yes, so that's why, why he went long. <laughs> um, but. Uh, the two is in Monroe County, I believe from who was at the table, is the only, the only district that collects cell phones is Greece, the four high schools in Greece, and they, they collect. So um, we're, we asked for, you know, just some information. I think the superintendent group will be digging in a little further just to see how it's going. They're, this is, I think, their first year. Mm -hmm. I look at Mr. Fox, I think it's their first year with this. Um, it's been bumpy the first few months, but they said it sort of it sort of um, settled out. I think maybe it's a conversation in terms of community-wide. I, I think that access to students is a shift for not just kids, it's also um, families and caregivers who are texting and you know all those pieces. So it would be a reminder that you know we do have phones in all of our offices. We have an attendance line, a main office line, a, a grade level assistant line. So it's something we can look at. And the other one is the late start for high school, which so far is only Webster that made that shift a couple years ago. And talking with Webster, like, you know, do you have any data? Because I've talked to a couple community members, like, do you have any data? Like, it would be great if you had, like, before the change and after the change and look at our attendance rates when, you know, got better or grades. It's just they changed and then COVID hit. So so really all their data sort of out the window um, is what they've looked at. I, I don't want to say it's out the window, but it's pretty tough to look at because you had COVID in the, in the middle of this. Um, 
that that being said, there are a couple other districts who are looking at um, studies. So no no definitive change, but continuing to study Fairport, studying it again, and uh, Pittsburgh is studying as well. So I don't know where that will go, but it's something you know if the board is interested and the community is interested as we look at uh, moving forward. It definitely takes some planning and time. I think for both of those, um, in Greece they use the there's a name for them, but the pouches that lock up and you yeah. they don't unlock until the end. So. Right. Um, yeah, so they could. I won't tell you the way students found their ways around that. Well, I won't say that publicly. I don't want to give anybody any ideas, but well, it is definitely the fact interesting. That they're locked and unlocked means that at the end of the day, they can see if there's a change in pickup plan yeah, or yeah. something like yeah. that. So it's not like they have to wait till they get home. No. no. But um, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's definitely those pieces, and I think our new code of conduct. Um, really hearing from students is really that like n n none at all at elementary so I'll share we've had to um, it's not really phones at elementary but it's smart watches that's mm -hmm. the piece because it's really cool and you get you know and not not always the um, you know not always the I don't the Apple product that's very pricey but there's lots of other ones mm -hmm. but it's still this you know it's a hard conversation because it is a fun gift to wear but but it is an electronic device, so we don't allow it. The K-5 middle school is supposed to be in your backpack or locker. You know, I, I got to um, work at Bay Trail for a little bit, and they, they, they definitely, you don't see a whole lot. There's phones that pop out, but it is not really. I thought I'd see a lot more at lunch and things like that. There wasn't. The high school is still the only place um, where we allow them with some, some rules, but something to definitely take a look at. Yeah, I just remember that it was not just the social media piece, but also the socialization piece. Yes. Because in high school lunch, instead yep. of talking to friends, they're staring at their, yeah. not all kids, but so that is one of the reasons why, you know, anybody who's looking at men, youth mental health yep. is social media and lack of socialization, face-to-face yep. -face socialization. Mm -hmm. So anything that we can do that in the seven hours that they're here, which is their main time to socialize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's important to look at. Okay. Um, district committee, and we have audit committee. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so we only, it was a quicker meeting. We went over our internal control risk assessment um, some of the things were just basically we have a pretty stable staff, which is always a good thing. It helps. Um, one of the recommendations was examining um, the challenges just in managing and editing our payroll and reporting data and just looking for opportunities to minimize any chance of errors. Um, our drama club had significantly more in their account than they are actually using, so that was something we chatted about. Um, payroll um, expressed some frustration um, around the challenges of just processing payroll due to the complexities um, of just punching in was difficult for some people and they have to go back and fix it. Um, but generally, Penfield's doing really good. And, um, our, I feel like it was a positive report. Our risks seem to be relatively low. Oh, anything to add? It was quick. Oh, and then our next, I think we decided officially we're going to do stack as our next internal audit, which is our system for tracking accounting. Hasn't been done in a while. Thank you for explaining what that stack is. Well, it's only because I wrote it down. Because <laughs> okay. I don't to read it. Sounds like, yeah, that's good. Okay. Did I miss anything, Dan? No, <clears throat> I think you got it. The specific concern around the punching was with the transportation department yeah. with payroll. They're the only ones that actually use a physical punch clock. Um, so there, we have a system where you know, every day the office staff goes in and they see whether or not a punch was good, there was an error, and then you, know, you have to reconcile that on a daily basis. And it's also further complicated by you know, our collective bargaining contract where in the winter they have more time to prepare the bus because you have to de-ice it and get it ready and then you know that changes and people forget and um, just one of those really mundane sort of minutia conversations that you know we live with yeah just kind of is what it is that's all I got okay thank you yep. all right meet the candidates night um, this event will be held during a closed meeting on Tuesday April 30th 2024 
at 7 p.m. and will be live streamed in the same manner as our board meetings. Okay. Any unfinished business? I said I had a question. I forgot what it was. Okay. So next time, I can't remember. <laughs> I really had a question. All right. Well, next time when you I'll think write of it. I'll it down. Yeah. All right. Any new business? All right. Can I have a motion and a second that the meeting be adjourned at 8.41 p.m.? <laughs> Second. <laughs> all those in so favor? To leave. All those in favor? All in favor and not opposed? 